Compassion Plans, Episode 16, Inspiring the World, with Robert Neely of InspireMore.com. The world we live in is far from perfect. How can I effectively make a difference? This is Compassion Plans, a weekly interview to help you make the world a better place with your host, Bentley Davis. Welcome to Compassion Plans. This is Bentley Davis, and today I have Robert Neely from InspireMore.com. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you. Glad to be here. Compassion is generally about reducing someone else's pain. What pain do you help to reduce? For sure. So I think there's a lot of suffering in the world, and there's a lot of unintentional living. People will strive for a goal that they don't even really know what it is. You know, they'll they'll spend their whole lives pursuing something they never took any time in the first place to think about. And so I think we live in a very consumer-based culture where we consume cat videos and we consume funny articles and we consume, 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 consume. And it's just getting worse and worse. And so I think that brings on a fair amount of pain for someone in in a manner of they don't have direction in their lives. And I think you look at um, you know, there are recent studies on the Facebook syndrome. Basically, people will get on Facebook and look at people and how glorious their life is because people post glorious things about their life on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever. And that kind of rubs people and leads to depression in a sense. And so we're trying to combat that actively by using the uh, Internet media space to try to encourage people to live for more. So we essentially collect and create inspiring media content with the goal of getting people to think more intentionally about their lives. So we have videos, lists, articles, images, and they're all intentionally inspiring. So it could be the wide range of, you know, a skiing video or a a video on family or technology or whatever, but the point is that what we try to do is narrow it down to an actionable step or a thought that someone can really take away from the piece and actively apply their lives. And the example I always use is, uh, I think especially in the millennial generation, people will watch a movie or something and they'll identify with a character and the character will say, more money equals more power. And then they'll be like, yes, that is it. That is perfect. And then next thing they know, they have this plan in their mind of, okay, I'm going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to make more money. And they end up 15 years later questioning, wait, what am I living for? What's my purpose? And so I think not taking the time to intentionally think about that causes a great deal of pain and worry and anxiety and stress. And so we're trying to combat that in a socially relevant way, you know, making it fun, but still getting people to think about, wait, why am I doing what I'm doing? What would make me feel more alive? What is my purpose? Things like that. Wow, that's, uh, that's really great. So how did Inspire More come about? So I used to be a strategy consultant. And then after that, got my master's in ministry with a focus in leadership and ethics. And so in those studies, uh, just really getting into what is leadership? What is teamwork? What is it mean to drive change? What does it take to influence people? One thing that hit me over and over is just the concept of being inspired. We read this book, for example, called Five Dysfunctions of a Team by a guy named Patrick Lencioni. And the premise is basically that this one team has the best individuals and they have more money and more technology than their competitors. However, they're lagging behind. And ultimately, it's because they're not on the same page and they're not united and they're not passionate. And really for me, that comes down to the fact that they're not inspired as a team and as individuals. And because of that, they are in second and third place when they should be in first place with not even second place close at all. I just found that this concept of being inspired is critical. It's critical in being a leader. It's critical in building a business. It's critical in having a family and growing friendships being a team player, et cetera, et cetera. And even more than that, I think it's critical within us as human beings. It's an innate desire that we want to be inspired and we want to inspire others. I think it's, it's evident in everything, really everything. And so for me, that was very heavy on my heart and forefront in my mind. After I finished this master's, I thought, how can I communicate this? 
what is the most relevant and powerful way? And so I think for sure, one of the best ways to disseminate information today is through the internet and it's through content marketing. It's through videos. I mean, viral videos, for example, you create one thing and it reaches tens of millions of people. And so we just really wanted to use that force for an intentional good. And again, still have it be lighthearted, but have it be purposeful to try to get people to live more inspired lives. Because in order to live a more inspired life, it's not going to come from just sitting there and looking at other people and just stopping there or sitting there and consuming. It's going to come from consuming something and then thinking, how can I apply this to my life? And then actually doing something about it. And so, I mean, that's, that's the real genesis of the idea. And um, I think it's very important to not just consume, but to actually do something. And so that's really what we're trying to do is get people to take something in and then do something about it. So that's, I mean, that's where it came from. And that's where we're continually trying to go more and more is just bring out and promote being inspired and inspiring others. Was there a particular kind of day that you remember having this idea or did it just kind of build over time? Well, I'd say the the understanding of the concept of like being inspired, it developed over time, particularly in my master's. Um, and it developed also just in, in my faith as a Christian, just growing and looking more at Jesus as a model of a servant leader. And uh, I mean, it's just the Bible is bereft with examples of being inspired. And so that concept has developed over time. And then I'd say, though, it was kind of a point where this whole business concept hit me. Um, It was probably June of 2013. And then something that I started pursuing in late July of 2013. But uh, I was essentially talking about it with another person. And we were talking about how brilliant BuzzFeed is. I mean, they're they are an unbelievable company, what they do. But at the same time, their content has a lot of fluff. And it's great. It's great for entertainment. I mean, consuming cat videos is awesome or funny lists. And it's great. I mean, you need that. But what we want to do is take that model and apply it for more intentional living. And so I'd say kind of just that point when I was talking with a friend about that. And we kind of talked about action and crowdfunding and how it all how it could all fit together. And I think the, I really think it was after that conversation that night, kind of the idea for inspire more popped into my head, the holistic idea of media content combined with action, combined with funding opportunities, which is part of action as well. Yeah. So what was, what was your first step in kind of getting this thing started? Yeah. The first step was learning. (laughs) I mean, I was a strategy consultant and then a master's student and worked also as kind of a a marketing guy, ran a website on the side, but that didn't mean I knew really anything about what it meant to develop a website. So I just started talking to as many people as I could. I started with friends and then expanded out into family and family friends and friends of family friends and just met with people, met with lawyers, talked about what does it take to start a company. Um, met with thought leaders. I remember meeting with a, a essentially an HR leadership consultant, and he goes around and tells companies how to how to like better be employees and how to uh, be more efficient. And he consults leadership on how they can lead better and build teams better. And so, just bouncing the idea off of people who were experts in the field and getting feedback in it. That was critical to build my confidence to actually make those next steps. Um, Yeah, so it started with talking with people, with refining the idea, um, with getting specifics, meeting with lawyers, meeting with thought leaders. And then really within all that, the vision began to develop in my own mind. And so I began to share it more and more effectively. And so in that, in sharing my vision and getting feedback, was able to raise money as well. And so that was kind of the next step of just sharing the vision and then being blessed with raising some money for this project. Um, And then found, I mean, the next step for sure is finding a team who can help you with it because you can't do it on your own. And so uh, I began searching for people and 
it was awesome. I think God kind of put him in my in my lap, found a developing team that I would have never ever found probably, but I mean cuz they're hard to find, but they are just perfect. And so I uh, found them and then found someone else to head up kind of some design and some content and then found another person after that to help with marketing and we essentially went went from there and then launched in March. So it was a it was I guess a uh eight month time frame from the genesis of the idea at seven or eight months until we actually launched it live to the to the general public. And so a lot of that was refining vision, meeting with people, getting capital, learning the ins and outs, hiring people to join me and help this vision grow, and then refining, refining, refining. And that's what we continue to do today. So did your capital mostly come from kind of like angel investors, or did you take advantage of any of the startup incubators in Dallas? No, it was... uh, I mean, I think I was really blessed. It was essentially with me. I was talking with uh, friends and family and just casting the vision. And I I heard this advice about six months ago. When you go in looking for advice, you come out with capital. When you go in looking for capital, you come out with advice. And so, I mean, I, I was super blessed that I went in just casting the vision and asking for wisdom and ended up receiving funds because people were interested in investing. And so, yeah, it was through, it was more through just the network of Dallas of friends and family and family friends and friends of family friends. Usually when you have capital investment at some point, there needs to be a payout or a return on that investment. Um, What's your kind of path towards that? Yeah, for us, that is, that's a tough question. Just with our model and with the way the space is going, it's not something that we're 100% sure on our exit plan. I mean, I get asked that question a lot. What's your exit plan? But, I mean, honestly, my, my focus isn't as much on that. It's on growing an audience because here, here's one thing that's for sure. And, and this was part of the original steps is what does it take to grow an online business that is traffic-based? And that's kind of ours. Our revenue model is based on traffic. And so... Just after reading a bunch of experts, I mean, there's opinions all across the board that say you need the exit plan immediately from day one. And then others that say the opposite of that. And so I kind of landed somewhere a little in between and a little farther away from the exit plan that essentially said, build it and it'll take care of itself. And so that's that's really been our focus is just growing our audience as much as possible and then seeing what happens from there because I think there are just so many scenarios, especially in our business, right. about different res- revenue streams, different exit right. plans, et cetera, et cetera. And your investors, when you, were, you weren't really pitching the idea, like you said, you were describing the issue and asking for advice, they kind of came in with more of an altruistic mindset to this project. I'd say... It's definitely a mission-driven company, and that definitely is what gets people motivated. I think one thing that's unbelievably important in companies is to focus on the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Apple is a great example of that. Their brand is so prevalent because they focused on the why. They have their marketing and their branding down very, very well, and you know that they're trying to communicate we're more than just a product. And so with us, we're trying to communicate we're more than just a product. I mean, our whole vision is about the why. And so I think that definitely influenced, you know, our, our investors to want to hop on board. But I also think, you know, there's the other half of it is a business. And they definitely think that there is going to be success there. Right. But the success is going to be driven by that missional aspect of the business. And so it's, it's for us, it's a really interesting mix of the fact that the missional the purpose-driven side of the business, it is the most powerful aspect of the business, which helps the business be more of a business and generate revenue. So it's very closely tied together. So I don't think that I can necessarily separate them because I think the more intentional and impactful and real we're being with our users, then the more the business will flourish. Did y'all incorporate? Uh, We're an LLC. Have you looked into... All the stuff coming up with benefit corporations. Yeah, the B Corp. Yeah, yeah, I looked at that at the start. And as I mentioned, just part of the initial process of 
meeting with lawyers, doing some tire kicking, basically getting advice. Yeah, I mean, the B Corp, I think, is great, but it's also a little more expensive and a little more difficult to manage. So for us, an LLC was much easier. And I think down the road, something like a B Corp could make sense, but it's also something that we could, if we needed to, we could transition into pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really cool because you don't only have a fiduciary obligation to your investors. It's also like a, you know, an altruistic obligation. And so we're fulfilling that purpose by being an LLC, which is great. Yeah. And you don't have the, I mean, the challenge with being a a real life corporation is that your number one is that fiduciary and you can be fired. So you could be the owner of the company and you could literally, or the CEO and be fired because you're not making enough money and you could be, you know, because you're not stepping on people to get the money actually. Um, So, That'll that'll be interesting, but in LLC you don't you don't quite have that requirement anyways. So right. so you have the freedom to pursue that mission and go for the long long results, which of course are the social results, but also the yeah. you know the, sure. the financial benefit. And for us, it would have been much more expensive and taken much more time to be sure. a corporation. Time on the front end and time on the day to day. And so if you if you ever need to get be a corporation, you can always cram it in really quickly. I mean, there are law firms that do that all the time. A company is booming and they need to turn into a corporation and then they, they do it in, you know, a few weeks. Did you ever look at the question of doing it as a nonprofit? Yes, and for sure. So how did that decision process go? So we have a giving aspect to our company, kind of I mentioned earlier, the crowdfunding component. And so we we considered being a for-profit with a non-profit arm that essentially distributes funds. But A, it's very tricky. B, it takes a while to become a non-profit. And C, what we were proposing doing, there's no definitive law on if it is legal or not. So we th- that business model would be completely at the discretion of the IRS if we ever, you know, if, if we ever did that. So we looked at being a nonprofit and I think I'm I'm still open to us eventually transitioning to that if we ever need to, but I don't think right now or in the foreseeable future that makes sense for us. Um and I think it's similar to what you talked about, just the flexibility that comes with an LLC to move nimbly and move quickly. It's very beneficial for us. I think that's important for the listeners to hear that decision process that you went through and to think of options because a lot of people, when they're thinking of doing something kind of altruistic or mission-based, they just think nonprofit. And it's great to hear that you kind of thought through all of that and you found the LLC was the best thing for your project. Yeah, and I don't I don't think – I mean, this is something I was kind of convicted of is if we're doing something good, do we have to be a nonprofit? And – I think that's maybe a false sentiment. I think, I think it's, it's fine to do something good and to make money from it. It's all about how you steward and use that money. You know, if you're going to use it horribly and selfishly and for bad purposes, then that's an issue. But if you're going to use it well and you're going to invest it well in both in a business and a personal and other senses, then that's, that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, do you ever watch This Week in Startups? No. Okay. Jason Calacanis recently invested in a company um, that it's a it's a for profit company, but it helps uh, homeless people get off the street. Cool. But when he was investing with it, he had the um, owner of the company on the show, and he but he ended up saying, "Yeah, I'll invest, but any profits I get, I will donate." Mm-hmm. Which I thought was interesting, but it's almost weakening the prospect of the fact that we can have for-profit businesses that also benefit society greatly. Um, so I'm looking into that logic of how can we make this more normed where not only where we, we can make profits off of helping people out, or should we? I mean, I'm not completely settled on that, but it seems like that's that's a that's a place where our society is going, and also that most of our businesses need to have more of a purpose, mm-hmm. need to be more inspired in our business life and in doing our business. I, w- I mentioned I work for Hilton Hotels, and the founder Conrad Hilton had a saying: "World peace through world travel." So his belief was that as we 
spend more time in each other's country, it'll be more difficult to have a war. And that was one of the reasons why it was great to work for that company because I really felt inspired mm-hmm. by that. That concept of for-profit or non-profit is a, is a big decision these days and you have more options these days. Yeah. And I think like it's ultimately about where is the line drawn. You know, a grocery store helps people, right? Right. That there's no way that that's a non-profit. Right. And so, I mean, you can think of countless examples in between that spectrum. Right. But I think it's just about where's the, where's the line. Mm-hmm. And even then, like, I think we're, I think people are just so worried about what other people will think yeah. and about offending someone. I mean, ultimately, it's just, are you, are you convicted that it's okay and it's right and it's honest? I think just operating, operating with integrity, then you can be a for profit because you don't need necessarily the, to be a nonprofit to do good. Do you have any stories of a lesson you kind of learned the hard way while putting together Inspire More? Ooh, um, I think, yeah, a, a couple things. When you go and ask people who have done what you're done for wisdom, really consider it. And what I mean there is I was advised by some people who had been in the business for a while. They told me some very basic things to do. And I thought, yes, that is awesome, but I'm going to hold off on doing that because I don't think that we're ready. Looking back, I wish that I had done those things immediately. And I even one of the pieces of advice I got was do things as quick as possible. Get it out there as quick as possible. Launch this as quick as possible. Even if example A isn't ready, get example B ready and out there. For example, like someone told us, launch your Facebook page as quickly as possible. And I thought, eh, that doesn't make sense until the website is launched. But looking back, I wished I had launched that thing back when I first had the idea and just started developing the audience. I mean... Everything is sweeter in hindsight, right? I would have had no idea how to grow that Facebook audience. But if I had started that back in July, that would have springboarded us on our launch much, much more. So I think just the lesson of doing things as quickly as possible is very important. And when you have something in mind that someone has advised you to do, really take it into consideration. I mean, I've been advised some things that I haven't implemented because... They just haven't been right. But there have been other things that I thought, that's good, and I've kind of held off. I just think that's important. And even, I mean, I, I just think the lesson of doing things as quickly as possible is key. If we had launched Inspire More three months earlier, it would have been a much better time for us just because, I mean, getting specific, Facebook has really gotten tighter and harder to reach people. But rewind three months prior to when we launched, it was so easy. And so that would have probably helped us a ton. I don't know if we could have done that. We moved pretty fast as it was, but I think just the pressing urgency of it is is really important. And so that wasn't, I don't know if that's necessarily a hard lesson, but it is a good lesson for everyone to know. When you say moving faster, would it be fair to say that it's getting something out to people, even if it's less functionality and then kind of building Mm -hmm. on it? Yeah. Starting with a minimum viable product and just and going with it. I mean, again, it's easier said than done in hindsight, but it's definitely important. I'd say another thing is really focus on your brand and your messaging. I think that's something that we're still learning the hard way. I mean, to me, our mission and our value is very simple. It's very straightforward. But to a user, it's harder to understand that we are a content site that is purpose-driven and that has action and crowdfunding components. People who, are, who know the site well and visit, they know that for sure. But someone who comes for one post and then won't come again for another two months, which is probably the average internet user, it's hard, it's hard for them to understand that. So I think taking the time up front and coming up with your key messaging and your branding is important. And so you got to balance that, though, with being quick. If you need to launch something and you don't have the branding figured out, it's the question of, do I still launch it or do I need to figure out the branding? But I'd say just get both done as quickly as possible and focus on both a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one. That's really good advice. You mentioned crowdfunding. Can you give us an example of how your site does crowdfunding? Yeah, for sure. So what we, what we have right now, we essentially have a crowdfunding platform. We create and collect the most inspiring crowdfunding campaigns out there. So what that means is either we will reach out to people, nonprofits or individuals, 
or nonprofits or individuals will reach out to us with a cause. Probably the best example of that is, or I'll give two examples. One, we, we reached out to a nonprofit at the start called the Birthday Party Project. And essentially they run or they put on birthday parties for kids who have never had a birthday party before. And so these are kids who live in shelters or homeless, et cetera, et cetera. But they've never had a birthday party in their life. Something that probably anyone listening to this totally takes for granted. Something that I definitely take for granted. I mean, I was expecting and I do expect every year to have some type of celebration for myself. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's crazy because that's not the reality for the majority of people in the world. But I'm, I'm blind to that. And I, I mean, side note, I think that's another really important part of our site is just to provide that perspective of first world problems or first world problems, you know. Right. But with this cause, we essentially helped them raise money for a month's worth of birthday parties, which means they were able to celebrate uh, 60 plus kids by having birthday parties for them. And they had never had birthday parties before. So that was for a 501c3 nonprofit. Or another example is that uh, we heard on the news about this kid named Ben Pierce. He's from Denton, but he's losing his sight and will soon go blind. And so he has this desire to go see his dream sites before he loses his sight so that he can remember. We heard about it and threw up a campaign and blasted it out to our people, to our users, and to our networks. And um, we're able to raise 5400 bucks for him, $5,400. And essentially, he is going to use that to go see one of his dream sites. I think he's using that money specifically to go to Harry Potter World okay. in London. Really, with all of our causes, we want them to be inspiring in nature. For even if you just heard about the cause, whether it's a nonprofit or just an individual or something that needs help, that you hear about it and you're moved. Fitting into our mission of don't just consume, do something, we want to help fund them. And so that's that's our, our vision is that we want to combine the content and crowdfunding to basically get people inspired and then give them avenues to do something about it. And the crowdfunding is, we think, a, a great way to do that because it's unbelievably powerful. And I think in the next few years, it's going to grow even more. And I mean, just look at all the different crowdfunding sites popping up. So we're not trying to be a Kickstarter and Indiegogo. We're trying to essentially curate and host inspiring campaigns for nonprofits or for individuals. Has there been anything that's been kind of slowing you down and trying to get Inspire more out and to people? There's a variety of things. I think it's a tricky business to be in, the media content business, because there you're dealing with users who have in general a very quick attention span. People will read something and decide in under a second if they want to continue reading. Um, as far as like seeing it on a social media site or something. So I think that's difficult, just the fact that it's a saturated market. How it, we're, def, we're definitely different within that saturated market, but just in the general media content industry, we're one of thousands. And so I think the issue of distinguishing ourselves as not just another media content site is definitely something that slows us down because... I think really people can get behind this vision and and when they really do understand it, they are very behind it. But it's a matter of communicating that different value proposition quickly so that people can fall in love with the brand and the purpose. Because I think, I mean, just what our site is founded upon, everyone desires to be inspired and to inspire others. I mean, that is key in every human being. And I think just really getting that message across is is important. And so that is the difficult thing, is communicating that in a very crowded online world with lots of distractions. Do you have any resources or tools that you're using that you could probably share with us? Yeah, I can go through a bunch of specifics. One thing that I read was there's a guy named Peter Thiel. He was involved with PayPal and is a startup guru, and he teaches a class at Stanford. And a guy took notes on everything that Peter talked about, and then he published it online. And so if you search Peter Thiel's online notes from Stanford class, there's like, I don't know, 20 different lectures that you can read through. And that's super helpful. And so I read through about half of those and just kind of understanding what it is to be successful and how to separate yourself and what to really focus on as 
as a startup and someone who's leading a startup, that's awesome. That's a great resource. As far as marketing, social marketing is key for everyone nowadays. And if you disagree with that, then you need to reconsider. But a leading expert on that is a guy named John Loomer. So if you Google him and just read his blog, you will learn a lot about social marketing and marketing in general. So that's very important. We use MailChimp for our our mail, and I think that's a fantastic application. I think another really helpful resource is getting plugged into a community. That's not necessarily an app or something tangible that you can buy, but that's the most valuable because then you learn about all these little specific apps. And so for me, that was probably one of the best moves I ever made was getting plugged into the Dallas entrepreneur community and meeting people, picking their brains, learning about different apps, learning about different strategies. I mean, that's, that's hands down your best resources, people with expertise. And so if you try to do it on your own and siloed, you're missing out on so much wisdom and you're going to make so many more mistakes. Whereas you can go learn from someone who's made those mistakes and can guide you. I mean, that's, that's the best resource and that's critical to anyone doing anything is learning from others. And in the Dallas area, especially, there's been a huge growing of, I guess, co-working spaces, Mm -hmm. but it's even more than that. So right now we're in the Dallas Entrepreneurial Center or the DAC. Um, How long have y'all been kind of? We've been at the DAC since November. Okay. So that was was in the previous building. Yes. And then you moved over here. Mm -hmm. And so that's been really helpful to you. Very, very helpful. Yeah. And then I've been able to plug in in a couple other ways too, just going to events and then I'm involved in this thing called House of Genius, and it's awesome. If you haven't heard of it, look it up. But essentially, once a month, people will get together. It's about 15 to 20 people will get together, and they'll they'll hear pitches from three different entrepreneurs. These people give feedback to the entrepreneurs, and it's an invite only, but you can go on and apply to be a part of it. Um, But basically, the, the interesting thing about it is that you don't know who anyone is. You can't talk about your background. You can't say your last name. You can't do any qualifying statements. And so getting plugged into that has been really interesting to hear pitches and to, I pitched myself. And so getting feedback from people and I had no idea what their expertise was. I was able to listen and not focus on the title or the background. And it's really, it's a really unique way to get plugged into the startup community. But I think co-working spaces are awesome. The deck is great. They have a bunch of classes and one million cups every Wednesday. Getting plugged in and approaching people is really important. People are way more approachable than you think, especially in the entrepreneur community. People want to share wisdom and they want to help. It's not a cutthroat environment, and especially in Dallas, which I like. I think that's an invaluable resource. Just going up to people and sharing your idea and they'll have wisdom for you or they may even want to join up forces and help you. That's brilliant. Really like that response. So the Compassion Plans listeners like supporting the guests that come on the show. What are two things we can do to support Inspire More and you? For sure. Number one is get on the site and use it. We just want more people to be a part of our community. Number two is get on it, use it, get familiar with it, and then tell your friends. We're, we're doing some really cool things. And so just being involved and in, uh, supporting us by telling others is huge for us uh, because we, we really do want to build a vibrant community of people who, who want to live for more. And we have some really interesting videos. We have some really interesting articles some really interesting lists. And we're doing some fascinating things just as far as action goes and crowdfunding. So I think just helping us by getting on and being a user and then telling your friends about it, that's huge. That's our number one ask. Y'all are not just curating content, but creating mm-hmm. content, right? So, so yeah. those lists are original. Some of that stuff is original to inspire more. Yep. I have been following your Facebook page, and I haven't been seeing a lot, I think, on my main feed. And You've been mentioning that Facebook's a little bit harder. I think one of the things that we could also ask for on these Facebook posts is that if you friend one of these pages and you see something from the page, hit like and hit share. Yes. Because I don't know if people know how the algorithm works and is that, you know, they will show it to a certain percentage of the audience that are liked to that page. And if it gets interaction like like likes, comments, or share, and actually it'd be best if you could do all three, 
then based on the interaction, it will expand to more people. Yeah. So just in liking a, a, a content from a site is also supporting that site. For sure. I mean, tangibly, besides getting on the site and telling your friends, the best things that you can do are sign up for our email list if you're interested. We only send it twice a week, so we don't bug you. We just send you the best of the best. And then like us on Facebook and interact with the things that we publish. So like you said, comment on it, share it, like it. And our and our our deep desire here is not just to pump out random media. It's that we're pumping out things that actually make a difference. And so when you do those things, you sign up or you like or you share, you're actually spreading things that can have an impact on people's lives. That's the real heart behind it. So in that way, we're partnering with you to make the world a better place. Exactly. And it's interesting. I like the idea of the email list because... That's the one place where you can be sure that we see the content. You may, we may forget to go to the website. Right. We, may, we may miss it on Twitter if it flies by, which it usually does. And Facebook flat out may not show us. Right. <laughs> but the email list, you know, you get everything consolidated in one space. You can read it on your convenience and, and then interact as you can. For sure. So I think that's a great resource for the group. Tell me what you've been doing on college campuses. Last spring when we launched the site, we also launched a college chapter program, a pilot program. And so we did it at A&M, Texas A&M. Uh, this fall, we're expanding in definitely into one more and hopefully three more. But the idea is that we've essentially rallied college students to go do inspiring things around the campus. And so that could be a fundraiser. That could be a crazy event. That could be that they go do something and create a video out of it. If you go on to Inspire More and type in A&M, A and then the and sign and then the M, you'll see some of the things they've done. But probably my favorite is that uh, one of the things they did, they wrote on two signs, you can do it, good luck studying. And they went around the A&M college library and they basically held up these signs without saying a word and went up and pointed at people. And people loved it. They lit up. They smiled, they were taking pictures, and then they turned it into a minute and a half video that reached like fifty to 60,000 people. And so we're doing, basically like they're trying to create a community that does fun and inspiring things that can make a difference at A&M. And so we're trying to replicate that at other colleges. And the idea is basically, you know, do things on the ground in real life that actually matter and actually inspire. So uh, if... Yeah, if, any, if you have an interest of starting one at a college campus, then definitely reach out to us on our Contact Us page on the site. But it's something that we're growing and that's exciting and that anyone can be a part of. Well, Robert, I really appreciate your time in the interview, and I really appreciate that you've started Inspire More, and I look forward to seeing it do great things. Awesome. Thanks, Bentley. And thank you so much for listening. Get the links and notes for today's show at CompassionPlans.com slash 16. Never miss an episode by entering your email into our subscription list while you're there. If you appreciate what we're doing, go to CompassionPlans.com slash appreciate to find out how you can spread compassion by rating and reviewing this podcast on iTunes.